Good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation this morning is on total hip replacement fixation method in patients younger than 50, 65 years old. Um, so total hip arthroplasty is the primary treatment for patients with end-stage hip arthritis who have otherwise failed non-surgical methods. The goal is to replace the arthritic joint with components that will fix the patient's uh, and that fixed to the patient's anatomy in a stable manner, <clears throat> providing them with the ability to immediately rehabilitate from surgery, while also minimizing the likelihood of future component failure requiring further surgical intervention. Younger patients undergoing arthroplasty generally have higher revision rates during their lives. So consideration about maximizing longevity of a prosthesis is critical when operating on this cohort. So this talk will be focusing on fixation op options in patients younger than 55 undergoing primary hip arthroplasty and won't address revision arthroplasty. So I thought just before starting this presentation, this would be a good video to show in regarding my feelings behind uh, fixation choice. I'm sure you can all remember that ad from the uh, early to mid 2000s where they talked about all the different options of milk and someone just wanting milk to taste like real milk that's sort of the feeling that i got when i started reading more and more into types of fixation so broken broken down into broad categories there are three main types of hip replacement fixations cemented uncemented and hybrid within each category particularly within the femur there are different variations upon the method of fixation which i'll come to later in the acetabulum, component fixation is generally separated into all poly cemented and metallic press fit with or without screws. Cemented metal back components are generally not used given the high failure rate of these components. And I'll speak about the outcome of these at the end, but the vast majority of the talk will be regarding fixation of the femoral components in younger patients. So a quick history of fixation is that cemented fixation was first described by Gluck in 1891, but was made popular by John, John Charnley in the 1950s with the Charnley stem and a modified acrylic cement that was borrowed, for the dent, borrowed from the dental community. Uncemented fixation has been used throughout the 20th century with varying results, but pop, became popularized in the 1980s given the number of failures associated with cemented hips that was initially thought to be due to cement disease, but also the advent of stems with a microporous surface that had the potential for bony ingrowth. Over time, cementless implants have become popular in the USA with over 90% of implants being uncemented and with various usage throughout the rest of the Western world. In general, the principles of different choices of fixation method are in cemented hip replacements. The cement acts as a grout to produce an interlocking fit between surfaces um, with two interfaces. So the bone cement interface and the cement prosthesis interface. And in uncemented total hip replacement, the goal is biological fixation of the metallic prosthesis to the bone, either through bone ingrowth into the porous structure of the implant or bone on growth onto the micro divots of the grid blasted surface of the implant. <clears throat> so the goal of a cemented femoral component is to optimize the bone cement interface and have a cement mantle free of defects, which is at least two millimeters thick and have the femoral component centered in the polymethyl methacrylate cement mantle. The concept of a taper slip stem is that it's highly polished and designed to settle in the cement mantle, but not bond to it. And through the process of creep, convert compression forces into hoop stresses through the bone cement interface, thus subsiding, but continuously loading the bone. And some examples of a, a tapered slip stem that you'd be aware of would be the exit of the V40, the CPT, the C stem, or the MS30. A composite beam stem is a shaped closed design with a roughened surface and pre-coating designed to make the stem bond to the cement. They usually have collars, ridges, or flanges to assist with the bonding and optimize bone loading. And examples of this are the Charnley and the Harris pre-coat hips. Um, there are another other, number of other considerations with cemented prostheses, including cement type and viscosity, antibiotic impregnated cement, bone preparation technique, cementing technique, generation, femur door type, or previously irradiated bone, but they won't be touched on today in this. The goals of a cementless femoral component are initial press fit, where the implant is slightly larger than what was broached, causing good initial mechanical stability and an optimum environment with minimal micromotion to ensure biological fixation and then maximizing longevity of the prosthesis through avoiding stress shielding or excessive rigidity, i.e. optimizing the stem bone stiffness ratios. <clears throat> the key factors for optimal biological fixation are pore sizes on the implant between 50 to 300 microns, although ideally 50 to 100 microns is the best, 50 to, uh, 40 to 50% porosity, essentially no gap between the bone and the prosthesis and minimal micromotion, noting that more than 150 microns of micromotion can lead to fibrous ingrowth rather than bony ingrowth onto the prosthesis. 
And a key factor for long-term survival of the prosthesis is prosthesis stiffness. A more rigid stem can increase stress shielding, so metal alloy choice can decrease the modulus of elasticity, bringing it closer to that of bone. Other design factors to affect rigidity of the prosthesis are implant size or coronal slots within the prosthesis design. So what are the causes of failure or revision? So aseptic loosening, uh, which is either usually due to poor initial fixation or mechanical loss of fixation over time or particle-induced osteolysis. Stress shielding, which, as I mentioned, is uh, to do with stiffness of a prosthesis, so proximal femoral bone loss in the setting of a well-fixed stem due primarily to ex an excessively rigid stem or a large diameter stem. Uh, or intraop fracture. So this is a risk in any press fit technique, either in the acetabulum or the femur. And the treatment of this is based either around identifying when it has occurred on table and assessing the component stability. If it's stable, then adding additional fixations such as acetabulum screws or femoral surplus cables or limiting imme immediate post-op weight bearing can be considered. Um, if unstable, then removal of components, stabilization of the fracture and component revision is required. So why is this important? And why is it important for me to go through all this before going into the age categories? So in Australia, there have been 125,468 patients who've had their primary hip replacement performed when younger than 65, which is the same as a full MCG, plus some people spilling over and nearly filling Amy Park during non-COVID times. With a population that's increasing in size year on end, a limited public health care budget in normal times, let alone the COVID era, and the cost of any revision surgery, consideration needs to be made regarding the health economic cost of providing effective care that minimises costly revision surgery or reoperation. So this group of patients makes up approximately one third of all patients undergoing total hip arthroplasty in Australia. And given the average life expectancy in Australia is in the mid eighties, they have a reasonably high risk of outliving their prosthesis and certainly have a statistically significant higher hazard ratio for revision at almost all time points when compared to patients aged greater than 75. Revision, revision surgery comes with higher risks, higher complication rates, longer in-hospital length of stays and greater financial burden to the hospital system. So minimizing revision risk is critical for providing effective care in the long term to our patients. <coughs> so what is the current evidence? In terms of evidence, the vast majority of the literature around this question is from international joint replacement registries. There are very few prospective studies comparing fixation method, let alone fixation method in a younger population. And realistically, a prospective randomized study to find evidence of an answer to this question would be logistically quite challenging to perform. Given the 15-year survival rate of a number of hip replacements is greater than 90% on the AOA National Joint Replacement Registry, the number of patients that would need to be involved in a trial to see the number of failures, as well as the length of follow-up required without loss to follow-up, would be a near Herculean task to undertake. For example, this randomised control trial into cemented versus uncemented fixation did a 17-year follow-up of 250 patients, which found that uh, over half had died by the time they were assessing, meaning the accuracy of their data would be limited by their small number. Plus, by the time you finally publish a paper with this length of follow-up, it's highly possible that science and technology have evolved to make either the technique or the prosthesis obsolete. So given this, let's have a look at the findings in some joint registries. Firstly, I thought this was a very interesting one. It's a community joint registry of 77 surgeons across five hospitals from the USA. And in 2013, they published a retrospective analysis of 6,500 nips, finding cemented stems were more likely to have been revised during the time period than uncemented stems specifically for aseptic loosening. But when you looked at all cause revision, they had a similar survivorship amongst the cohorts. And I thought this was particularly interesting because noting that USA has a nearly 90 plus percent rate of uncemented stem usage, this cohort had about one third of their stems being cemented, which I thought was curious for that population. <clears throat> the New Zealand Joint Replacement Registry reports revisions in a slightly different manner to the Australian Registry. They take the total number of cases, add up the time the prosthesis has been implanted to calculate the observed component years, then calculate the number of revisions per 100 component years based off the number revised. This table shows that in patients younger than 65, there is a much higher revision rate of cemented hip replacements compared to uncemented and hybrid, noting, however, that the volume of patients in this cohort is lower. The lowest revision rate for patients younger than 65 was in the uncemented cohort, and this was particularly more pronounced in patients younger than 55 years old.
<clears throat> I'd be lying if I said that my Swedish was anything more than cursory, but there is minimal information regarding outcomes of different fixation methods when compared to age group in the Swedish registry. One slide uh, in their most recent paper spoke about volume of cases based off fixation method. And the interesting thing to note in Sweden is that 71.7% .7 of all hip replacements done over a 20 year period were fully cemented, which is in stark contrast to the Australian experience. The Danes were kind enough, however, to write most of their tables and figures in English, so I was able to get a little bit more information from their data. The percentage of patients across their population having cemented total hip arthroplasty is similar to Australia in that it's about two or so percent. However, they perform nearly 70% of all of their joints as uncemented. And in patients younger than 70, over 90% of arthroplasty <coughs> was uncemented and around 8% were hybrid fixation. In regards to the outcomes for fixation methods in young patients, there was a higher rate of revision in all cemented and hybrid components in younger patients younger than 50, 60 and 70. However, with a relatively small volume of hybrid and cemented hips, it's difficult to assess whether the higher revision rate is related to the component fixation choice or low volume surgeons having higher revision rates. And the AOA National Joint Placement Registry being released only a few weeks ago presents the most up-to-date uh, data on arthroplasty outcomes and survivorship in Australia. The hip arthroplasty summary found no difference in the rate of revision between cemented and hybrid fixation and only a higher rate of revision for uncemented arthroplasty within the first three years. And then there was no difference. So I'll go into this in a little bit more detail here. So in general, patients younger than 55 have a higher rate of revision across all time periods than their greater than 55 counterparts. However, the National Joint Replacement Registry found that aside from a high rate of revision in the first months of uncemented hips in patients between 55 to 64, there was no difference in the rate of revision across each fixation method. And what was interesting to note is that at 15 years, the average survivorship for a hip replacement done in Australia was between 93 to 95%, which I thought was excellent and something that can be certainly used to counsel patients prior to hip arthroplasty. So cementless fixation erred towards having a lower revision rate than hybrid fixation at 15 years in both the 55, uh, less than 55 and the 55 to 64 year old age groups. But this was not reported as being statistically significant. And you can see from this in the previous chart um, that around the 10 year mark, the revision rate begins to climb for uh, hybrid fixation over cementless. And with reporting as far out as 19 years, it'll be really curious to see whether the 2022 National Joint Replacement Registry finds a statistically significant difference in this cohort at 20 years, because it appears to be erring towards there being an actual difference now. So I guess the summary of this, in the same way as the, the milk ad just wanted milk that tastes like real milk, I just, as a surgeon, want a hip replacement that works like a real hip replacement. So what did I find from the literature, all cemented, Hip replacements have a higher revision rate in patients less than 65 in some registries. Hybrid have the same as uncemented in some registries, however, a higher revision rate in patients younger than 65 in other registries. And cementless fixation was non inferior from the revision rate perspective in less than 65 across most registries. However, the key drawback of registry data is that it takes highly heterogeneous data and makes it appear homogeneous. And given the variety and principles of fixation type and design within cemented and uncemented cohorts, plus the lack of data on which components specifically failed, it's important to remember that like milk, not all hips are the same. Thank you.